Olympia, Washington. All right, the numbers are still climbing. People are still coming in. Sky Nest Cascadia in sunny Minnesota. People are complimenting you on your background. The radiant halo of archaic mushrooms. Our Pasadena and Denver. People are still coming in. People are enjoying, people are saying they like the, the story of your first journey. So what I'm going to ask you guys as you come in that, you know, chat as much as you like in the chat window and then use the Q&A for relevant questions. And we'll check in on that every once in a while. Give it just maybe one more moment. Numbers have maybe stabilized, still climbing a little. Fantastic Fungi is better. It's a better movie than Mean Girls. I believe Douglas <laughs> Finkelstein's favorite movie until yours came out was Mean Girls. I had a nine-year-old girl um, at a boat dock in a remote island in British Columbia recognized me from Fantastic Fungi. It was her favorite movie. I thought, a, wow. I a really, my demographic... Girl? a nine-year-old girl and her parents had not seen the movie and they were like this it was it was i thought my gosh that's the greatest compliment i've ever had yeah that is amazing yeah the, the you know the children shall lead us nine-year-old girls yeah. telling their parents how we can change the world i asked her what her favorite part was and she said uh, all the intricate psychedelic designs <laughs> the future psycho not there <laughs> Hopefully future. And the book is good too. Some people might not know that there's a, a really gorgeously designed coffee table book as well. Oh, right. A yeah, mushroom Louis, baby. Yeah, Louis Schwartzberg, you know, is the director of Fantastic Fungi. Mm -hmm. It's uh, currently number one still on the number one docs on Apple TV of all time. Mm. It's got 100% on, on, on Rotten Tomatoes. This is, uh, Louis would not say this in public, but I will, is that it got turned down uh, at Sundance. They didn't understand it. Got turned down, you know, at the Cannes Film Festival. Again, they didn't understand it. And yeah, it's got 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. Only eight films in the entire world have 100%. And it's, it's, it's significant, I think, not only in Louis's vision and perseverance and his amazing skill, but it's tapped into a worldwide underground movement of uh, yes. people rising up. So my hat off to Brother Louis. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, it is. Um... Yeah, so... I mean, just comprehensive, profound, and beautiful. So, okay, it's it's five after, it's six, at, six after. People are still coming in, but we should get started. Thank you all for being here at the Psilocybin Summit. It is really wonderful to see you here on day three. We are really at a, wonder, at a wonderful point in the program. It is... You know, my great honor, uh, I'm full of gratitude, I'm really, really happy to be able to 
welcome the, um, you know, you need no introduction, but I'll give you one anyway. The, uh, uh, Paul Stamets, who is um, an inspiration to, to so many of us. And I will just read your bio, um, although people know who you are already. Paul Stamets is a speaker, author, mycologist, medical researcher, and entrepreneur, is considered an intellectual and industry leader in fungi, habitat, medicinal use, and production. He lectures extensively to deepen the understanding and respect for the organisms that literally exist under every footstep taken on this path of life. Paul is the author of six books, and he has discovered and named numerous new species of psilocybin mushrooms. Paul has been awarded more than 40 patents with several patent applications in queue for the unexpected activity of psilocybin analogs stacked with other substances. He has received numerous awards and his work has entered into the mainstream of popular culture. In Star Trek Discovery series on CBS, the science officer is portrayed by an astromycologist, a Lieutenant Paul Stamets. Paul's work with mycelium is a central theme to this series. And I would also like to congratulate you on recently becoming inducted into the Explorers Club. You are the world's newest explorer, putting you on par with people like Jane Goodall and Neil Armstrong and many, many other just great um, explorers. Well, welcome, welcome to the summit. Well, thank you, Brother Daniel, and thank you all uh, for entering yet into another Zoomlandia. We seem to live in Zoomlandia these days during this uh, pandemic. So my talk today um, is has some very new information. Um, it was first disclosed at the University of Arizona Medical Conference um, two days ago. So um, my talks are always con a continuation and they're always are evolving. I want to dedicate this talk to indigenous peoples, to the First Nations. In a sense, we are all indigenous peoples to this planet. But the subjugation of indigenous, indigenous peoples by monotheism and the suppression of their native rights, their land, the subjugation of their culture and the loss of ancestral knowledge does a damage to us all. And so thankfully there are threads of this knowledge that have survived over time. And I think it's really important for us to recognize the heroic efforts, the pain, the suffering, and the achievements of those ancestors who have preceded us on this path of using psilocybin mushrooms and sacred plants for the benefit of human consciousness and evolution. So um, I'm going to rock and roll. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen now. So let's hopefully this works. Um, and, uh, and I think, oh my gosh, I think I can know how to do this now after so many attempts and um let's see brother daniel can you see that yes you're all good okay okay good all right so psilocybin mushrooms and their emergent medicines and um tomorrow is 9 20. we had 4 20. i always celebrated 4 20. um and 9 20 is the celebration of those the use of psilocybin worldwide so I wanna show just three slides for those people who are not aware, especially physicians. And I love uh, converting, if I can, with data, skeptics uh, into supporters. These are current universities, institutions engaged in clinical uh, studies on psilocybin and psychedelics in general. It's a who's who, the most prestigious universities in the United States and in even indeed the world, Harvard Medical School, Stanford, Imperial College, University of Toronto, Penn State, even the Department of Veteran Affairs. So this is really a sign of the times because each of these universities and institutions had peer review boards, uh, IRBs and institutional review boards that had to look at the data, the justification, the safety profiles, the intended uh, outputs, the design of the clinical studies, and they went through approval. Uh, this is not an easy task. And moreover, many of these universities are now uh, confirming that of the previous studies. And Johns Hopkins and Roland Griffiths and his team are certainly the ones who get the 
most credit, I think, for sort of piercing the envelope um, and getting the FDA and medical scientists uh, up on board and the use and study of psilocybin mushrooms for in a clinical setting. So what's the North American Academic Centers in psilocybin research? Here is a slide put together by my good friend, uh, Dr. Pam and I, and this is specifically on psilocybin uh, research. There are indeed other universities have been approved. Frankly, we don't have enough space on the slide to include them all. But if you're involved in a university currently that has just received approval, I know the University of California at Berkeley has just started and instituted its own psychedelic center. So we'd like to know about them. So please feel free to get a hold of us and let us know. Well, you're looking at the European uh, uh, countries, and this is the academic center is currently involved also in psilocybin research. So this is a worldwide scientific movement. And from my limited understanding, this is unprecedented to have so many universities simultaneously engaged in psilocybin research all across the planet. So I'm gonna show a very a short video that is provided to me by Theracil. And Theracil is a, a movement here in Canada for the therapeutic use of psilocybin for end of life. And so hopefully this will work. Working? It's not working. I'm not hearing it. Okay. All right. Let's go stop. Let's go back. Let's sit down here. Two oh. momento, folks. This is what happens when you're doing. Um, let me just go ahead and take off my earpods or what? And Daniel, will you let me know when you do hear it, please? I, I I don't what maybe we want to stop the screen share and then start it again and make sure we click the button. There's like a little there's often when we hit screen share, there's a little button in the bottom corner that says use sound from computer. Okay, use sound from computer pen. Share computer sound. Uh, Roger that. Thank you, everybody in Zoom. Little glitches. And Daniel, are you hearing this or not? I'm still not. Yes, we're good. That was very, it's very difficult to get, to wrap your head around. I'm, I'm dying. The chances are that I'm not going to be around in a couple of years. I heard about a network in Vancouver of therapists who are um, treating patients with psilocybin, patients with anxiety and deal, who are dealing with life and death issues. I thought that really sounds interesting to me and, and there's no danger. I'm there with two other people in the room and uh, so it's something I wanna, it's worth trying because I, I need to be able to enjoy my life. And all of a sudden, everything was light and and beautiful, and, 
and warm and, and uh, I felt just this rush of warmth and love and and just peace come over me as, as the lights came up. I'm so fortunate that I had those connections that I heard about this uh, network of therapists that are willing to risk their licenses to treat people with this drug that's not not legal and I think it's so wrong that people don't have access to this because people are in pain and dying and uh, or PTSD or depression and which studies show psilocybin helps all of those things and why are we not allowing people to have this drug but we allow them to have other drugs that are so harmful. We have given people the right to die um, and and I think that's great. It's I don't know if I'll be brave enough to choose that option if the time comes. Um, but it's there for people when they, if they need it. But what about living? What do we do in between that part in the process of dying? It's a long process sometimes. So how are we gonna pe help people through it? Do we want people to be living with the anxiety and fear? Or do we wanna provide them a way to be able to deal deal with things that need to be dealt with in their life that are painful and hard, um, but also to be able to experience the love and joy and peace that, that this has provided to me and to other people that I've talked to. This trip actually changed everything for me because now I'm able to live each day just with peace and joy and love every day and and not have this thing weighing on me. I feel so much healthier and lighter in a, in a way even though I have this thing inside me that could kill me but like I said today I'm not gonna die I'm good <laughs> and that's all that's all any of us have. Thank you, Sarah Theracil. And um, also for Theracil, I made this one minute video uh, to help promote this cause. There's two things certain in life. We are born and we die. Where do we come from? Where are we going? With the psilocybin mushroom experience, you suddenly know that you're part of a giant oneness. And it gives you context and consolation about your own mortality. So I think it's critically important that at the end of your life, you have a right to these substances. Who dares say that you do not? When these have been used for thousands, probably tens of thousands, maybe millions of years, and laws have been created to ostracize people to use them only in the past 50 years? I mean, it's, it's, it, it's not only academically naive, it's immoral. And it's, I, I think that everyone has a right to how they're going to leave this life. So this is a great slide by David Nutt. And as uh, Lori mentioned, um, there are so many drugs that are approved that do cause harm, and yet mushrooms are on the extraordinary uh, scale of being the least toxic um, of the drugs commonly used. Um, not only least toxic to the person ingesting the mushrooms, but look at also the collateral damage or the lack thereof to others in their immediate surroundings. We all know about alcohol and heroin. Opiates have affected my family quite deeply. Um, and the collateral damage that causes to the family, to the court system, law enforcement, the expenses of society just ramifies outwards. It is a tremendous disease that we face with the opiate, uh, opioid crisis. And yet mushrooms uh, are extraordinarily on the opposite end of the scale, and yet they're not even legal for prescription. So let's look at some other commonly used drugs. Now, what happens if you take 
10 times by mistake uh, of these FDA approved medicines. Well, likely death, warfarin, a blood thinner, you'd bleed out, the, the goxin, lithium. Um, these all have very uh, critical LD50 windows that you have to prescribe within. Psilocybin, there is none. What happens if you take 10 times more psilocybin? Not death, well, you might have a more deeply spiritual experience. So this is really quite extraordinary. And moreover, when you take psilocybin mushrooms and you have a deep journey, the next day, the, the typical reaction by most people is they go, no way. They don't want to take these again for a long time. It was so, so substantive experience. They need to process it. So these are anti-addictive by their very nature. So there is a decriminalization movement sweeping the world. You know, Decriminalize.org is the point of this spear. Um, as many of you know, I've heard about these, these the de decriminalization movements. Now psilocybin, mushroom possession, has been decriminalized in Denver, Oakland, Santa Cruz. Soon, we hope Detroit, Washington DC, Seattle is sweeping the country. I think decriminalize.org mentions that more than 100 cities are organizing uh, for decriminalization of psilocybin. Now, this is not legalization. This is reducing um, the priority of law enforcement. So the pr prosecution of uh, possession and cultivation of psilocybin mushrooms is the least uh, uh, priority of law enforcement for prosecution. And what that basically means is uh, that if someone got busted, got arrested by a law enforcement officer, there are no public funds allocated for the prosecution of that individual. In fact, it's a riot violation of their right uh, and their duty uh, to their office to spend public funds on such prosecutions. So I think this is a great relief, uh, not only to law enforcement and the judicial system, but of course, at a time of greatest need of these substances, it is to be very helpful if people realize that they're judi judicious and careful use of these substances, they're not gonna be prosecuted for, uh, for that use. Number of species that I have published so far, uh, Azure Essence, Lossaby Linoformans, Sinofibulosa, and one I named after my good friend, Dr. Andrew Weil. Uh, Dr. Weil was well ahead of the curve, uh, working with psilocybin mushrooms literally since the mid 1970s, perhaps earlier. Um, and so I named the species after uh, Dr. Weil uh, because he has been instrumental force and unabashedly um, promoting the, the fact that a change and the interest in altering your consciousness is part of your quote unquote natural mind, literally the title of his book uh, that was seminal in this concept. So looking at the comparison of different components, three of which, psilocybin, psilocin, and baocystin, psilocybin is a prodrug. And psilocybin is a prodrug, what that means, psilocybin dephosphorylates upon ingestion into psilocin. Psilocin passes into your bloodstream and activates your receptors in your brain. So psilocybin is a prodrug, it converts to psilocin. And um, so psilocybin azurescence has almost 2.2% um, psilocybin and psilocin, an extraordinary amount of the psychoactive uh, crystals uh, by dry weight. Um, it's, it brings the, up the question, why are these substances being produced by these mushrooms? Um, psilocybin uh, semilanciata, the next one, Liberty Caps, Many of you pick Liberty Caps in Washington, Oregon, Ireland, and, and Norway, et cetera, uh, grows in grasslands. It doesn't bruise bluish, um, but it's very high in psilocybin, very low in psilocin. So typically those species that have major components of psilocin tend to bruise bluish. Those that have very low amounts of psilocin, very high amounts of psilocybin in contract, uh, do not bruise bluish. But the general rule is that if a gilled mushroom uh, has purple brown spores and bruises bluish, then there's about a 90% plus uh, probability that mushroom is a psilocybin active mushroom. Uh, and, and my books speak to accurate identification practices. Psilocybin mushrooms of the world uh, covers this in, in great detail. So let's look at some of the meta analyses that have been going on uh, currently around the world. Um, this is one from DSHS looking at prisoners. 480,000 people are surveyed uh, in this retroactive survey. And now association is not causation, but it can be. But interestingly, if these prisoners had taken psilocybin at least once in their lifetime, there was a strong correlation on the decreased odds of, of, of larceny and theft, property crime, uh, and violent crime. 
So, I mean, that's extraordinary. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper into this. Another study out of British Columbia found within 1,266 community members that if there was a negative relationship between psychedelic use, including psilocybin and LSD, and intimate partner violence. So those people who tend to use psychedelics tend to be less prone to violent behavior. Well, these are with meta studies with psilocybin mushrooms, not pure psilocybin and psilocin. Well, there are studies with psilocybin and psilocin. Let's look at a few of those. There's an increased empathy reaction uh, to the emotional uh, 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 facial recognition of other people uh, with those people who have had uh, uh, taken psilocybin. You have increased empathy, uh, increased ability to relate to others and to, to understand their suffering and being able to emote uh, with them. And I think that's really important. People want to be heard. And when you know that, so you're speaking to somebody about your trauma and they are indeed listening and you're being heard, well, that is a major step forward in a therapeutic resolution. There is a reset mechanism that's proposed that has been well described by many other researchers on a 5-H2A uh, receptor agonist that psilocybin um, is active at. And this it helps people be able to, in a sense, reprogram or use different neurological pathways putatively uh, that allows them to do an end run about, uh, around the embedded uh, trauma um, neuro, neurological sequences that have been a, so much a part of their disease state. Um, there is also increased relation to nature. I think many of us know this. When we eat psilocybin mushrooms, we have this expansive oceanic response and we start looking at our context and our rule in nature as organisms on this planet as being uh, something that's very much foremost in mind. There is also a pro-environmental influence. Uh, I think that also speaks to, to the previous study. So a, a well used uh, by Dr. Robin Carhart Harris, thank you, Robin, is this connectogram showing uh, the integration of neural networks from a placebo versus psilocybin. Uh, so I, there's much higher and more brain activity that is going on. And I think this is also stimulates creativity and also leads to neurogenesis. Well, the effects on the hippocampus and the neurogenesis and extinction of fear, trace fear conditioning is what PTSD is all about. And an extraordinary number of, of studies are increasingly pointing to the fact that um, you can supplant, in a sense, uh, and I'm not a psychotherapist, I'm not a psychologist, um, but having a PTSD experience that you resolve through a deep session of psilocybin, MDMA, LSD, or other psychedelics, is that years later has been shown is that the primary memory then becomes anchored is the resolution of that experience through the psychedelic uh, event, not the experience itself. And so re-remembering uh, your psilocybin experience in dealing with your trauma is medically uh, uh, beneficial. So this means that psilocybin induces neurogenesis, it induces courage, and it induces kindness. These are leadership skills. And this leads to better citizenship. Now think of this, this, the importance of the ramifications of this. If we can reduce crime, burglary, theft, partner to partner violence, people can resolve their trauma, families are happier, more productive, and I like to say, when you're creative and uh, you're happier, when you're happier, you're more creative. It's sort of a binary choice. When you're depressed, you're not as creative. But if you're really creative and you're doing artwork or you're writing a book or you're doing something, that, uh, uh, new dance steps, you're excited when you wake up the next day to further that creativity event. And oppositely, when you're depressed, you're not as creative. So I think this speaks also to the body intellect of our society. Uh, these, the use of these substances can increase the body intellect and the knowledge base of our society to come up with more creative solutions. And obviously we need those you know, today uh, more than ever before. So it's hard to overestimate uh, the benefit of psychedelic use to our society and helping our economy and uh, helping our ecology uh, helping uh, our ecology of consciousness. Uh, these are all interrelated. And I think I really believe that the net benefit to society by, by every one of those metrics 
uh, is astonishingly significant uh, in the positive sense. So cell side mushrooms are the first smart mushroom. I like to say lion's mane is the second smart mu mushroom. This mushroom is an edible and choice mushroom. It tastes like lobster or shrimp um, when it's cooked. And there's uh, multiple studies on this uh, mushroom. There's three clinical studies in particular. The most recent one, I think from 2018 in Taiwan with pre-Alzheimer's uh, patients. And it shows significant improvement and, and um, slowing down, even preventing and reversing uh, cognitive dementia. So this um, it's a double blind experiment, but note the, the compared to the placebo, the study period was eight, 12 and 16 weeks. This becomes significant later on in my talk. So this uh, is the uh, most recent study that has been published. So double blind placebo controlled study with lines named mycelium. This is important because the mycelium is giving this neurogenic benefit uh, that, can, that is clinically observable and confirmed, but the mushrooms are not. Uh, the mycelium I've maintained is the immune system of the mushroom. Uh, the mycelium upregulates and expresses, uh, in the case of reishi mushroom, 25 more percent of the genes are activated in expressing proteins in the mycelial state and the mushroom state. The mushrooms are intended to rot. You know, they're very, very perishable. The mycelium has to navigate through a microbial hostile environment, uh, you know, over months, years, uh, before it suddenly forms into a fleshy fruit body, like the fruit of a tree. These are, this is the fruit of the mycelium. So it's the mycelium that has a, a lot more of a powerful uh, immunologically intact system innately, and also provides the neurogenic compounds uh, to a greater and more beneficial degree. So amyloid plaques uh, oftentimes are an artifact of Alzheimer's and in post-mortem, these can be clearly seen. They also can be induced in mice. And the amyloid plaque formation coincides with demyelination. A myelin is the sheath that goes on the, uh, the outside of the neurons that's conductive or transmitting uh, signals. And the demyelination, the loss of myelation and the formation of amyloid plaques um, interfere with that. Um, so, consequentially, looking at these amyloid uh, plaques um, and the uh, proteins that they exhibit um, can be, be a determining factor in diagnosing whether a person has Alzheimer's or developing Alzheimer's or not, in combination with other markers. So, we started doing a series of experiments with lion's mane uh, mushrooms and lion mane mycelium uh, with a, a, a company called Neurofit that is pre clinical research on anti-Alzheimer's uh, medicines um, on using pluripotent stem cells. Um, and this is on neurite proliferation. And the brain-derived nerve growth factors uh, are coming from uh, the endoplastic reticulum, uh, typically in pig's brains, harvested. And basically, it, the neurons are spiked, uh, and you see increase in neur neurite proliferation, aka neurogenesis in the broadest sense of that definition. So you see about 15% increase here um, in a seven days, and this is done in sextipulates. So there's six uh, different replicates here. The lion's mane mycelium also showed a significant increase, about 8%. Interesting, the fruit bodies did not. They actually uh, showed neuro uh, restriction uh, of growth. So that, well, that was fascinating. It builds off some of the pre previous research. But then we started looking at cell and analogs. Now, for many years, I had a, a covered my drug enforcement innovation license under the, the Dr. Michael Bug at the Evergreen State College. Um, so my, all my research was, was uh, legally uh, protected. Um, I don't have a DEA license now. Uh, we will be applying for a new one shortly. Um, but so we looked at some of these psilocybin analogs, which are not illegal. Uh, they're not on schedule one. And uh, we're looking at, again, the brain-derived nerve growth factors. Well, in this case, it increased by 42%. Lion's mane, 111. was well, 108 before. So it's within the, that range of variability. It's acceptable. But then we're looking at bioassistant, norbiosystem, norcilocin. Um, this is provided to us uh, by the USONA Institute, uh, Bill Linton and his team. So thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Bill. Um, and we started comparing this now by spiking at different dosages. Uh, the same um, neurites to see if there's a response in neurogenesis. And sure enough, we did. Uh, I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, we are the first people ever to show that these psilocybin analogs stimulate uh, neuron outgrowth. So in this case, 19%, 29%, 
uh, and 5%. So interesting uh, difference in ranges there, but these were done all individually in comparison to lion's mane and BDNF. Well, then we took the best and we said, or two of them, uh, not necessarily the best. Uh, so we did different combinations and the highlight of this, uh, these combinations is shown here. So in this case, now we went from 114%, 115% uh, increase in neurons. So before it was 108, 111, now it's 114, also within that range of acceptable variability. And then there are, are this analog, uh, Z as we call it, increased by 7%. When you add those two together, 7.7 .7 and 14.8, you come up to 22%. To that would be if it activates separate receptors and if the, this is the, the theoretical additive effect arithmetically. This is under the, the best of conditions saying they're operating a neurogenic pathways separate from each other and they're compounded. Well, in fact, we got 36%, way above the predicted additive uh, uh, theoretical effect. So this suggests the entourage effect. Uh, this, uh, that the stacking, lion's mane, with psilocybin analogs can uh, excite uh, neuron proliferation. Uh, given these tests. Now we've done this six times, so this is unambiguously uh, is significant. Um, and now we're looking at all sorts of other combinations and it becomes very complex here when you have a multifactorial equation like this and you want to you know, understand which combinations are best. So we're very much actively uh, looking at these legal psilocybin analogs uh, stacking uh, with lion's mane. So recent research by our good friend at Harvard Medical School, Rudy Tanzi, has also found these very same micello extract have very, very potent anti-neuroinflammatory effects in vitro. So not only do we excite neurogenesis and be able to excite neurons to, to regrow and proliferate, increasing more synaptic junctions as, as well, but they're anti-inflammatory as the, the cell divisions are in, uh, occurring. Uh, this, I think, is also really important. Uh, because um, typically uh, immune response is associated as a pro-inflammatory uh, response, and I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more. So I propose a nootropic uh, vitamin complex, a stacking formula of psilocybin mushrooms, uh, presumably psilocybin, uh, psilocybin cubensis, the most commonly used, at 1%. This usually comes around 0.8%. Uh, but just for the math being simple here, using one tenth of a gram of psilocybin mushrooms, using about 400 milligrams of lion's mane mycelium, and then we add niacin. Now, we already know that psilocybin analogs with lion's mane enhances neurogenesis. And my idea is niacin is really important because it's a vasodilator um, and it excites the endpoints of the nervous system. So many of you have had niacin flush, you get red, you get itchy. Um, it's not harmful, but it speaks of vasodilation and excitation of, of, the, of the nerves. Well, neuropathies oftentimes present themselves as a deadening or dying back uh, of the nerves at the endpoints on your toes and your fingers. So the idea of the vasodilation is to bring these neurogenic benefits to the endpoints of the peripheral nervous system. So um, that's re really important to understand because in doing so, then we can make this an over-the-counter vitamin subsensorium uh, in terms of the psilocybin not having an effect that you notice. That's what subsensorium means. So a microdose by definition means you don't feel it. So you're not intoxicated, you can drive a car, everything else is normal, but you're taken below the threshold of intoxication or being noticeably changed. Um, the RNA scenes, of course, that you just saw increased neurogenesis uh, over several days, not in a six hour event as in a therapeutic dose would be. And so the niacin then also becomes the quote unquote ant abuse, uh, because if you took 10 times uh, the microdose to try to get a liftoff dose, you'd have the niacin flush, which is very, very uh, discomforting. And if you're taking two grams of niacin, those of you who've dared to take that much, you know exactly what I'm talking about, an extremely uncomfortable experience. So I think the stacking formula makes a lot of sense. Now, my good friend, James, uh, Jim Fadiman, he has his protocol. I suggested mine totally independent of each other. You know, we don't know, <laughs> we, but we're just, um, we both subscribe to the idea that we need to renormalize and to take a break. So this is the receptors are washed of psilocybin. 
Um, you can use your endogenous then uh, receptors that renormalize, and then you then re-stimulate them. Um, so Jim starts to recommend starting at 0.4 grams or less. I get lift off at 0.4 grams. 0.4 grams is, a, is not a microdose for me, uh, but this also speaks to the individual sensitivities of different people to different doses. So not only do you have the variability of the psilocybin in each mushroom, but you have the idiosyncrasies of the individual in terms of how sensitive they are. Uh, so some people have, feel no effect, even at three to even to five grams of psilocybin, and other people are extremely uh, sensitive. So erring on the side of caution, I like this lower dose amount rather than the higher dose amount. So working with Ismail and Kaylin, a quantified citizen, and uh, Dr. Um, um, uh, um, Zach Walsh, uh, and some graduate students in, in Canada, uh, we have launched this app. It's at microdose.me. It's available for, right now, iOS and Apple devices. It soon will be available for uh, droids. And the um, app is a, is a way of you being able to measure uh, your neurological state over time. And so I announced this on Joe Rogan, that over 12,000 people subscribed to microdose.me and we're doing a meta-analysis. And the idea along the same um, theme that I mentioned before of trying to find signal from the noise, and this is what physicians need. They need these meta-analyses to see if there's justification for clinical studies. So we'll just look at how this works very quickly. Um, the, uh, it, it's gone through um, uh, ethics review. Your information is anonymized. Uh, it's not shared with others. No one knows your name. Um, and then the microdose of less than one gram or higher. Whether you're stacking it with lion's mane, niacin, chocolate. We, many of us really believe that chocolate enhances the soul time experience. Then as a memory test, uh, Donald Trump, take note. And then it also has a uh, auditory uh, test to test your hearing, your sight, a coordination test. So this is being elaborated as a new version also is in the making uh, soon to come out. So in doing this now, we have thousands of thousands of people who have reported back. So I'm gonna show you is a snapshot uh, of the first four weeks of this data. So again, let me re, re, reiterate that since we're talking about microdosing, as we defined it in this app, a low dose is uh, 0.1 grams, a tenth of a gram or less. Medium dose, a tenth of a gram or higher. Higher, higher dose is more than a third of a gram. You can see the majority of people were in the medium range, range dose. So here is the preliminary data uh, um, on microdosing with psilocybin, the effects on mood, depression, and anxiety. I would make the case that Depression and anxiety are a subset of, uh, uh, mood and anxiety are a subset of depression, but that's for others to debate. So we had 8,703 people, baseline microdosers. The majority of them were psilocybin users. Um, it's interesting that there we had non-microdosers as well. That people who then uh, downloaded from microdose.me enrolled in the app and they never microdose before, during, uh, and subsequently. And so we had a good baseline of people uh, as a comparative who are not microdosing whatsoever. Now the disproportionality of men to women may be an artifact of fact that I mentioned this on Joe Rogan and the majority of those listeners uh, tend to be uh, more uh, men than women. So look at this, this is unprecedented. And what we have, I think all of us who are sharing in this study and I, Need to full disclosure. I'm a I'm a, a minor stockholder and micro and a qualified a quantified citizen um, that is running this app. But looking at this data, we were all surprised at the, its significance. In terms of the non microdosers, 70, 76 people reporting, there's basically no change in their depression or anxiety. For the microdosers, 143 people, substantial change. That p-value of significance is less than 0.001. For those of you who are not familiar with p-values, um, a p-value of 0 0.05 gives you 95% confidence the data is strong. Uh, 0.01 is 99. This is 99.9% confidence that the data is real. Now, moving to mood, uh, a positive mood increase versus negative mood. You can see, again, the most 
uh, population had a substantial increase. Look at the p-value significance there, uh, just clearly significant. And the negative mood with people with micro uh, with uh, with the non microdosing, um, you can see that the uh, microdose uh, people had a decrease in their negative mood, and the non non microdosing people basically uh, had flatlined. So this is on a PANAS scale, which is uh, commonly used and 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 looking at new uh, psychotherapeutics, and. Um, then we looked also at lion's mane. Well, to me, this was kind of good news because lion's mane did not interfere uh, with the depression or positive mood. Um, and moreover, in the research that I spoke about on the, on the clinical studies, they went out beyond four weeks, eight, 12, and 16 weeks. And that to me makes sense because neurogenesis takes time. Your cells are dividing. And so the longer the window uh, of neurogenesis, the more proliferation of neurons, synaptic junctions, integration. Uh, and so we're looking forward to see how this stack with lion's mane uh, and niacin will perform. Now, this has not gone through peer reviewed. Uh, th this is uh, uh, papers that we plan to be publishing uh, that are in process now. So we welcome peer review comments. Uh, but this is a meta study that'll be then more, become more refined, more disciplined over time to be able to try to uh, disambiguate the different factors. But I think this is really important because these are with psilocybin mushrooms. This is not with psilocybin, the pure chemical. Um, so just in compared to SSRIs, which are hugely contra controversial, is they're clearly better. Positive mood implications are huge. Uh, the, put the putative title of our paper uh, that we're uh, in process of of preparing is preliminary data on microdosing psilocybin effects on mood depression and anxiety. Um, so, okay, let's look at the advantages and disadvantages of psilocybin mushrooms for compared to uh, pure pharmaceutical grade psilocybin. So, psilocybin mushrooms, face it, you know, the reality is 99 plus percent of the population are taking psilocybin mushrooms, have been, are today, and will be in the future. So, it's widely available. Psilocybin, psilocybin in pure form is not widely available. The psilocybin mushrooms are very inexpensive. Uh, we don't know what the expense is uh, of, in terms of the affordability of, of psilocybin. It's not controlled by pharmaceutical companies. It can be grown at home. There's a well-established long history of cultural use. The entourage effect I just mentioned are present in the mushrooms and they're not present with just psilocybin. You're taking a pure molecule by itself. And there's a great appeal for the use of the natural form because of its historical use and wide, uh, uh, wide long-term recent decades use uh, of psilocybin mushrooms uh, um, by, by modern culture. Well, there are some disadvantages of psilocybin mushrooms. There's variability in psilocybin and psilocin. Uh, I'm not sure if that's all that important. Uh, look at the meta-study that we just, uh, we just published. Uh, contamination due to molds and bacteria. This is a very serious issue. Uh, I have been growing mushrooms for the past 45 years. Uh, this is a huge sort of behind the veil uh, secret of the mushroom uh, cultivation. Um, you know, uh, uh, companies out there is they do get mold and bacterial outbreaks. There's no CGMP standards yet, no accountability yet. And there's also a lack of confidence of wary consumers who'd rather have a pharmaceutical as opposed to a natural product. I know some people who want to go into a clinical setting with the hospital staff and doctors and support, you know, equipment all around them and technology. Uh, other people want to be out in nature. Uh, well, that former treatment uh, circumstance is tens of thousands of dollars in expenses. So in a sense, it excludes a huge segment of our society and makes it only available to those who are privileged and rich who can afford these treatments. Um, so the psilocybin advantages from our pharmaceutical company is CGMP is contents guaranteed, impurities are minimized, it is controlled by pharmaceutical companies that are identifiable, so there is accountability, and there is confidence that you get a measured amount. There is a pathway, thank you Rick Doblin for providing this to me, and MAPS, um, is the Botanical Drug Development Program with the FDA, allowing for the uh, development of psilocybin uh, mushrooms or psychoactive plants like ayahuasca for being approved as a drug. Uh, so there is a runway uh, for approval of natural products as a medicine, something that I'm very excited 
about pursuing. So in my sense, this can boil down to plant medicine uh, versus uh, profit or people medicine versus profit medicine. Uh, people medicine is psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, profit medicine, um, up until two days ago, I, I thought profit medicine was primarily localized in the pharmaceutical for-profit companies. Uh, Bill Linton and USANA have just open sourced uh, a methodology for inexpensively producing psilocybin, uh, which I think is a game changer uh, for those uh, individuals trying to exploit psilocybin uh, for pharmaceutical profit. So my, my hat off to uh, Mr. Bill and the USANA team for open sourcing uh, that information. <laughs> so what are the future targets? Well, there's memory, cognition, intelligence, coordination, visual acuity, hearing, and immunity. Well, those diseases are obvious to all of us, I think. But let's look at immunity. This is really important. So there are numerous studies, I'm just citing two of them here, that depression could be a dysfunction of the immune system, but moreover, it can be bidirectional. If you are depressed, it's well shown that you have a decreased cytotoxic T cell, natural killer cell activities. Your immune state is, is depressed, literally, as well as your emotional state. And then they, there's a bidirectional communication between the neuroendocrine and immune systems. And this could uh, contribute to new clinical treatment strategies. So first I ask you, do you believe this? Look into the scientific literature. If you accept that your emotional state influences your immune readiness state, then the fo following that I'm gonna suggest is not such a quantum leap. But then coupling microdosing could help immunity. If you're happier, you're creative, you're going into a treatment protocol for cancer or some other chronic disease, and your immune system is at a better state than it would be if you went into that clinical setting uh, horribly depressed. I mean, given that, then I think this is a potential game changer. Microdosing with psilocybin improves impression. Immunity improves with improved mood. Microdosing could improve immunity. I'd like to hear the arguments against this. And please, if you're gonna cite literature, I wanna see it. Um, but the literature is pretty much in unanimity of opinion from what I've read that your emotional state of being influences your immune system and vice versa. So I am happy to report that the FDA has approved us for a COVID clinical trial using agaricon and turkey tail mushrooms in association uh, with the University of San Diego, Centers for Integrative Health, Dr. Gordon Sachs and Andrew Kuboff um, um, get uh, uh, most of the credit for this. There's a whole team of about 10 of us uh, have been involved in this for the past year or past six months. The Hoya Institute of Immunology has also agreed to be involved in their FDA approved clinical study. We have funding from the Krupp, uh, Krupp Institute uh, but more funding is needed. So I'll just put it out there um, that Lee Stein is our point of, of contact here, Lee Stein at gmail.com for the, any of those people who are interested in this. Now, to be clear, we are not recommending microdosing for the clinical study in fighting COVID. Um, I want to be absolutely clear about that. However, I think in the future, uh, physicians and medical researchers out there you might really consider microdosing uh, as a uh, beneficial precondition uh, to help uh, the resultant effects of your conventional therapy downstream if immunity is a primary factor um, in that treatment. So, and uh, I will not take any press interviews on this. So please, anybody in the press, don't contact me. I'm only presenting this for the benefit of the people who are watching this presentation. So one of the things is if you increase immunity, you might increase a cytokine storm. This is an overamplification of the immune system. This mycelium is grown on rice and the rice is fermented just like 
milk is fermented into yogurt. Uh, rice is changed biologically into a novel uh, immune product that stimulates interleukin 10s and interleukin 1 RAs. These are anti-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, this is a very important. It increases it um, up to over 6,000, 7,000 times. So it helps to uh, modulate the immune response. So your cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells are, are increased, but you don't get pro-inflammation proflammation that you would see otherwise associated with immune stimulants, you have a buffered immune response. So please stay tuned. Our phase one clinical study should begin end of October, early November. Uh, we, indeed, we do need help on this. This is uh, funded totally by philanthropy and goodwill. And so anybody who's interested in helping out, then please get a hold of Lee Stein at leestein at gmail.com. So these are mushroom solutions. Now, as you could laugh at this if you tell somebody, a physician who's not at the learning curve, well, you know, that sounds very weird. Uh, but understand that our ancestors went into nature for hundreds of thousands of years. There's about 150 to 200,000 species of mushrooms. Think of it like going into a library of knowledge and you're pulling out each species, each book out of the library. You're reading it, you're testing it, you're interfacing with it. And it works or doesn't work, you put it back. We build upon the body intellect of our ancestors through trial and error to find out what foods are edible, what plants are edible, what mushrooms are edible. And so we have narrowed down the field of species down to less than 200, but 50 species in particular out of this vast library of nature that interferes, uh, inter intersects with our microbiome, uh, does not interfere with our microbiome, has our prebiotics, and there's lots of literature on mushrooms being prebiotics and microbiome as well. So I think this combination of these medicinal foods, the FDA has a category for drugs, foods, and nutraceuticals, but there is not a category for yet for medicinal foods. And so I would hope that in the future we would have this. I populate with my team, um, Renee Davis, our director of research, uh, a website called mushroomreferences.com. It's unbranded. Um, it is pure science. Uh, we uh, curate this website hundreds of pages long now with some of the best references on the medicinal properties of mushrooms, including the lion's mane studies, including all the studies we know on psilocybin. Uh, again, if there are studies out there that we should know about, please get a hold of us and we'll populate this website. We, we, uh, we populate it about once a month and I'd like to give a shout out to Sergey Brin and Larry Page. You've made my life a lot more interesting but difficult because I'm on the victim of Google Scholar alerts. I get way too many of these, which I have to wade through for hours every week. I also have a personal website, also unbranded, um, for you want, if you want to see the, some of my peer-reviewed articles and literature that I've been involved with, uh, please go to paulstamus.com. And I want to end with a uh, shout out again. We started to my brother Louis Schwartzberg on Fantastic Fungi. Um, this has been a game changer. Um, a lot of us have been working, like Dr. Andrew Weil, the program for Integrative Medicine, uh, the University of Arizona Medical School. We've been working uh, in an uphill battle, trying to make a paradigm shift. Well, Michael Pollan's book, I think, uh, enormously moved this subject forward into the mainstream. Um, and then came Fantastic Fungi, uh, the movie now it's widely available across almost all media platforms. Only eight movies that I know of in the world have 100% of Rotten Tomatoes. And Louis Schwartzberg has just done a fantastic job in making bridges of communications with people outside the psychedelic movement. So I see this as a civil rights movement. This is a revolution from the underground uh, for the uh, freedom of consciousness. We all should have control of our own brains. And I don't want any government telling me what I can put in past my skull. That is my territory of my own domain. And I have privacy and, and rights uh, to that. So I want to end just with this little two minute short from the movie. And thank you again, Louis Schwartzberg. Enjoy. So in conclusion, I believe microdiversity is biosecurity. I believe the loss of habitats uh, is the reason why we have zoonotic diseases such as COVID, bird flu, swine flu, other disease vectors, 
coming out of factory farms and also through the destruction of the forests. Uh, Jane Goodall recently said, and she put it quite starkly, is that if we don't get our act together and understand the implications of factory farms of animals, it could spell the end of the human species, not the end of the planet, the end of our species. It's time for us to wake up. The ecosystems are in jeopardy. We are destroying them. And now this is a, a call for everyone to understand that we are a reflection of the environment in which we grow and we live. If we don't protect that environment, we don't protect ourselves. Our ancestors and descendants are calling out to us to make a difference. I wanna thank foremost, Dr. Andrew Weil, Andy, your vision that you articulated 40, 50 years ago has now become mainstream. It's an apparent truth. We just know this to be true. We have the scientific evidence that it is. Uh, my friend and partner, Dr. Pam Crisco, many of the other individuals here, and again, a big shout out to Yosona, the research there, Mr. Bill, Mr. Bill Linton, Louis Schwarzberg, and I wanna thank my fellow researchers and also uh, the individuals and, and collaborators at Quantified Citizen. So um, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate it. I am both humbled and inspired by the knowledge that you shared and, and by your work. Um, you were talking at the beginning about how, um, you know, psilocybin cultivates leadership qualities. And I just feel like you embody those. You embody those really, really well. And I hope that, you know, everybody here, somebody wrote Paul for president. And oh, I'm just hoping that, you know, while people are appreciating you for you and what you're doing, that they are also, you know, inspired to also kind of take up the charge and to kind of live Thank you, Daniel. example and kind of, you know, we can all put our shoulder to the wheel to, to, to course correct our history so that, you know, so that we can have a future. The message is more important than the messenger. I'm what's one long lineage of, uh, of micronauts. In the background, I have a collection of 23 Mesoamerican mushroom stones that have come into my temporary uh, custody, which I fully intend to return to the Mayan people provided I can find a proper recipient for them. Uh, but this is what I see before I go to bed. And this is what I see when every morning that I wake up, I hear the voices of our ancestors and indigenous peoples. We must respect the right of indigenous peoples and understand that they have created and preserved many of the structures that we need to benefit from today. I'm not asking people to adopt Native American rituals. I'm saying learn from the, our elders, learn from the wisest ones, and be able to incorporate these lessons of benefit uh, for the best potential therapeutic use. We need more Einsteins every day. How many Einsteins are we losing? How many could we actually have here today if they were microdosing and then respecting nature and inventing some of the solutions that are so desperately needed to prevent this massive extinction event of which we are not only a part, but we're a cause. Mm -hmm. I love this because, you know, it's, it's one of the hippie platitudes that, oh, it's all, it, it's all in your mind, man. But you, you've, you've sort of taken that and, and shown us how it works, that we can work on healing and growing and evolving our, our mind, our, our neurological structure, and how that trickles down to everything else. Um, Dr. Pam gave me two questions for clarification. Okay. Sure. Um, the benefit on neurogenesis is from the mycelium, not the mushrooms. I thought I, I showed that. The fruit body is actually re, re tarted, reduced uh, neurogeneration uh, compared to baseline. The mycelium enhanced it. Uh, similarly, in, in terms of immunity, um, the uh, mycelium is upregulating many more compounds of the mushroom fruit bodies. The mushroom fruit bodies are nutritious, but it's the mycelium that's navigating through the isotherm above freezing, below, uh, below 110 degrees or so. And that isotherm is developed the strategies of immune defense that it cross 
correlates uh, to benefit uh, for us. So the mycelium uh, from the recent research, not the, the research from coming out of China that uses traditional Chinese medicine, of which many of it is very, very good. I'm not saying it's not, but the newest research clearly shows that the mycelium and the lipids and polyphenols embedded into the beta-glucan skeleton uh, that's being presided by the mycelium and the mushrooms uh, have a tremendous immune benefit. And that's something that we're real excited to bring to the forefront. Again, go to mushroomreferences.com and you can look up these references. Um, thank you. I mean, did uh, you have one other question from Pam? No, that was both no. of those questions. I mean, <laughs> I, there, are, there are so many questions and there's not really any time. Um, I have been, I will maybe find one that I think is kind of interesting. There's a doctor here who's talking about chronic pain and the neuroplasticity of the brain and how it apparently moves towards creating more pain for itself. And he's curious about perhaps, you know, some of these stacks for, for working with that as a treatment for chronic pain. Well, I don't want to ambush my friend here, but Dr. Pam is a pain doctor. Dr. Pam, could you come into this conversation or do you want me to wing it? Everybody write in the chat box how much you want Dr. Pam to come on. <laughs> okay, now wait, I, can you hear Dr. Pam? Can All you right. hear me? Of course, yes. Okay. Um, we, um, we don't have definitive data yet on that, um, but we have a number of case reports that we've been collecting. I've been collecting case reports for three years on this for neurogenesis of patients with chronic pain. And right now it's looking like pretty positive. So, I mean, I can't say definitively, but in my patients that have neurological uh, deficits around Parkinson's, MS, uh, post herpetic neuralgia, uh, peripheral diabetic neuropathies, it seems like um, whether they're using a stack or whether they're using, using lines, main mycelium, we're seeing a trend to the positive. And it's definitely on our radar for research. So it's a trend to the positive, it's observational data and we really do need to dive in and do the studies. Now, not only is Dr. Pam the co-founder of the Canadian Psychedelic Association, but we, she's also a, a, she's an MD treating chronic pain. Um, right. And so I would like to add on for what I learned from Dr. Pam, uh, speaking to this physician's uh, question about these um, neurological pathways uh, tend to be repeated over and over. And uh, one of the things that Pam has become an expert in is how do you interrupt, uh, in a sense, that neurological memory that's by rote, it's, uh, they're self-reinforcing. And this is something that psychedelics seem to have a, a very important implication in being able to interrupt uh, that, that, um, that those conventional pathways have been set up that are always reinforcing in inflammation and pain. And by interrupting them, so much of the pain that is being felt and presented is basically uh, related uh, to these neurological networks uh, that have been uh, an, a, a custom uh, in, in repeating these same pathways as opposed to finding a way around them. So right. that wasn't a very good explanation, but she, she, left the, she left the stage here, folks, so she could have said it better. Right. Uh, and Dr. Gianni presented on Thursday, and he does a lot of work with psilocybin and inflammation and also mixing it with um, you know, healthy lifestyle patterns, and he's found amazing results. Um, so that probably has a little bit to do with it as well. People are curious if there are other mushrooms you tested for neurogenesis properties other than psilocybin and lion's mane. Are there other things that might be beneficial for people? Well, I can only speak from the scientific literature that I know of. Uh, reishi mushrooms in the genus Canoderma you know, it had a long, long history of use for their, their anti-inflammatory properties. Also appears in the literature of other researchers to also provide neurogenesis. Um, so lion's mane and reishi are the two. There's one paper, I think, out on maitake mushrooms. Mm -hmm. um, but anything that is anti-inflammatory, uh, insofar as inflammation interferes with neurogenesis, uh, and interrupts these otherwise healthy cell regeneration pathways. I think any of these mushrooms that have anti-inflammatory properties are likely uh, to be a good candidate for study. But those mushrooms that have a combination like lion's mane of clearly being neurogenic and anti-inflammatory from the results from Rudy Tanzi from Harvard Medical School also 
that will be published in a peer-reviewed journal. That research is ongoing right now. So a big shout out to Rudy Tanzi and his team at Harvard Medical School for uh, looking at this. Um, and there are other species. I have about 700 species and strains in my culture library. Uh, by far the largest cultural library in the world uh, of agaricon, an old growth mushroom, which is uh, my involvement with the BioShield biodefense program since 9-11. Many of you are aware of that from my TED, my TED Med Talks. Um, and I do want to give a shout out to Larry Brilliant um, and Nathan Wolf. Uh, they were at TED for years talking about these pandemics. Uh, Bill Gates basically I picked up the rap from them in my mind these are the original researchers they're brilliant was uh and the final team that exterminated smallpox um he was a hippie in india and he got involved in the medical profession he's got a great life story um his book's called sometimes brilliant but we, many of us have seen these pandemics on the near event horizon many of us have stated why has this pandemic not come sooner the problem that we faced is not the pandemic of today, but the pandemics of tomorrow. When you have a convergence of swine flu, bird flu, God hope I mean, we don't have smallpox coming back. When you have so many of these pandemics converging simultaneously, our health systems are already stretched to the max. We will have further pandemics as we deforest the planet. Wood is the menu of food for the mycelium and mycelium is not only a basic foundation of the food web, I know and I have the evidence that mycelium controls the immunological health of the animal inhabitants resident within forest ecosystems. So you take the forests away, you challenge the immune system of those animal inhabitants, zoonotic diseases spread, overpopulation occurs beyond the sustainability of those environments, and you have pandemic diseases. That's the rule of nature, not the exception. That, terrifying, but thank you. That no, very, I think it's hopeful. It's, I think okay. it's hopeful in that all of us now are, are, have, have the intelligence, the resources, and the, the mechanism through using psilocybin mushrooms and these other mushrooms to make a paradigm shift. It's okay. imperative that all of us pick up this torch and carry it forward convince the skeptics to become supporters okay. show them the evidence go through this scientifically it's our reliance on science that's going to get us out of here not on propaganda not on politics okay beautiful thank you thank you for reframing that for me i appreciate it um one more quick if, if you can make it quick um uh, Dr. Fadiman is going to be here on Monday, and he's going to be answering some questions about microdosing. People are curious about why you suggest your protocol over his. Well, Jim and I just made this up. I mean, we're basically rooted in the same concept. Mm -hmm. you, you take a microdose, you pause to wash your receptors. Drinking coffee every day, you stop drinking coffee for five days. The next cup of coffee you have is, is really strong. You wash your receptors from the caffeine. This is basic neuroreceptor, you know, a uh, uh, philosophy. So whether it's, it's, I do four or five days on, weekends off. Um, James recommends uh, one day on, three days off. I think microdosing with the neurogenic benefits that we're seeing now, based on our app, microdose.me, clearly shows that microdosing more than once a week gives you a statistically significant reduction in depression, increase in mood, reduction of anxiety. So this is the interesting thing about this study. Despite all the variability of the receptivity of the patients, the dosage protocols, whether it's James Fadiman or mine, the variability in the dosage of the mushrooms, the data set's so large that you amateurize it and it still has significance. What if we narrowed the field of variables? The, the significance factors could skyrocket. Right. right now, in a sense, they're amateurized with all these other variables. And the more precise that we get in tuning these regimens, the greater the benefit logically that we should see. So it's a, it's a paradigm shifting discovery. Microdosing works. Psilocybin makes for kinder people, <laughs> increases intelligence. 
benefits society, reduces crime. Mm -hmm. Who's going to argue against that? Yeah, that's, that's beautiful. It's, um, yeah, I'm all for kinder, smarter people. I want to be kinder and smarter myself. Um, Somebody answered, the, the government would, <laughs> yeah, the government, the government right. would argue. We'll throw the government out. This is the people's revolution, folks. Time to rise up. Let's take back our, our future. Let's give a nod to the indigenous peoples that got us this wisdom in the first place. And I'm indigenous to Europe. And the Greeks use psilocybin mushrooms. Mm -hmm. In North Africa, they use psilocybin mushrooms. Psilocybin mushrooms are used all over the world. But it's because I believe monotheism and the conquest and the spread of diseases of bio-warfare against indigenous peoples that we lost so much of this knowledge. You know, thank Gaia, we have a thread of this knowledge left. How much knowledge have we lost? Mm -hmm. We can't go, go back in time, but we can go forward into the future. So let's, let's take our future back. Our descendants are calling out to us. Paul, thank you. This has been wonderful. Everything you've been said has been hopeful and wise. Um, I can't express my gratitude enough for you being here. I can't bow deeply enough. Um, I believe everybody here on the chat is um, ref ec would echo that that sentiment. And so I'm just you know very very appreciative that you would be a part of our humble little psilocybin summit. And uh, I look forward to seeing what comes next, what groundbreaking paradigm shifting discoveries we can push forward into the future. Thank you, everyone. Brother, Brother Daniel, I want to shout out to you. you. You are the epitome of the peaceful warrior. Uh, people uh, listening do not realize of your martial arts background, uh, <laughs> but you're having had schools for 35 years. You are the type of student that an instructor would love to come in. Mm -hmm. Humble, kind, thoughtful, deliberate. So um, it's time for the peaceful warriors to rise up and lead by example. So thank you, Daniel, for giving me this opportunity. And thank you, everybody, at the Psilocybin Summit. So let's take back our future, folks. The time is now. Let's take back thank our you. future. I will see you all in 10 minutes with uh, Shane Moss. <laughs>